Hey everybody, welcome to Class 7 of the Return of the King class. Today we move past the book and on to the, uh, to the appendices. Though not without first a glance back at the part of the end of the book that I didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, we are... Um, we're going to... Uh, uh, so I, I, I want to go back to the Scouring of the Shire. And with the Scouring of the Shire, I want to address a larger issue, and I want to do it in a kind of a different way uh, than I've often done before. The issue I want to talk about is allegory in Tolkien, allegory and applicability. Now, many of you have uh, thought a lot about this, heard me talk about this a lot, um, and I want to start off with a little bit of, re of a review. As I say, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction than I usually do when I talk about this. Um, people I I talk about the scouring of the Shire often when they want to do allegory, when they want to read um, The Lord of the Rings as allegory. And of course, in the foreword, in the preface, I should say, to the second edition um, of The Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien talked about allegory and, and specifically was refuting theories that were, uh, you know, suggesting that the, the, the story was an allegory of... of of World War Two, I think that Ed is trying to bait me by saying it's about relatability, not allegory. I hate the word relatable in this way. Uh, and let me just specify what I hate about that word. It's not that I hate all new words. I'm resistant to some. But what I strongly dislike about the word relatable, as almost all of my students, my, my undergraduate students, tended to use it, um, is that it is very imprecise. What they mean by it is something quite different from what the word appears to say. Uh, if you relate something, one would think that the word relatable means that it is possible to relate it, not that it is possible to relate to it, which is, of course, what people mean by relatable. Um, now, I understand that relatable to or relate toable is a much more awkward <laughs> word. Um, but uh, nevertheless, my response is so find a good one then. That's, there's, that's not, uh, um, that's just not right. Grockable. Tom, I like that much better. Tom suggests grockable with a K, of course. Um, Actually, Tom, I like that about a hundred times better than relatable. Uh, maybe I'll suggest that. Perhaps we can get grokable to catch it. It's, it's, it's not a pleasant sounding word, is it? Uh, but uh, I, I like, I like, I actually quite like the word grok. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I, I find that actually a very useful word. Um, useful. See, that's useful in, uh, in a way which is very different from um, the word grok, I mean, G-R-O-K. Um, uh, um, uh, and it me. oh, uh, 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 Jana is asking uh, what um, uh, what th that word means. I should explain that for uh, non-native English speakers. Heck, I'd probably have to explain it to some native English speakers. Um, the uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> people are already teasing me for digressing, but I don't care. Um, no, grok, uh, it means it can be used as a transitive verb. Um, so like you can grok something, uh, which means that you, you, you get it. You, you sort of, well, not relate to it exactly, but it's close to that, um, that, that you, get something in sort of a bigger sense that you can that you can compre not just comprehend it um uh but that you well I, I i keep wanting to use the vague word get it uh in that sense um but grok is a mo yeah you fully understand it says 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 erica um okay carissa says it's in the oxford english dictionary so there you go they define it as to understand intuitively or by empathy, to establish rapport with, and to emphasize or communicate sympathetically with, also to experience enjoyment. You know, Carissa, I now intuitively understand, I now grok the reason why I like the word grok, because it has given to English, at last, 
what modern English has lacked. And I've talked about this a lot in, with my students when I've been digressing on other occasions. That is the poverty of modern English, how we lack two different words for no. Uh, we lack the distinction, uh, you know, between like, the French connaître and savoir. That distinction, which so many languages have, to have two different verbs, one of which means to comprehend intellectually, and the other of which means to experience something, to, 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 to know something by experience or familiarity. Um, and we just use the word no about both of those things, and we haven't had that, that sort of clear distinction. Um, yeah, a bunch of you are referring to Heinlein, who coined it in uh, 1961. Yeah, I, I, should, I should cite the father of the word grok, um, though it's only come into popularity lately. At least I haven't, I didn't encounter it for a long time. Not being a devoted reader of Heinlein myself, though he's on my list. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I, I hadn't heard it, but I've been hearing it a lot lately. It's caught on lately for some reason, and I don't know why. Um, Tom suggests we should bring back wit. Yeah, they had a bunch of synonyms for no um, uh, in, uh, in, in Middle English, which we've lost. But anyway, um, uh, so I like the word grok. Grok is a useful word, much better than relatable. Grokable. Tom, I'm going with that. Um, okay, anyway. <laughs> now returning from my digression. I was talking about allegory and applicability. So, Tolkien famously says uh, in his preface... That, you know, he objects to the reading of the Lord of the Rings as allegory um, and says that it's not about allegory. It, it, that there is applicability, but there's not allegory. And the difference that he emphasizes there is that allegory resides in the domination of the, of the author and applicability, however, lies in the freedom of the reader. Both of those methods, that is, both allegory and applicability, are about taking a story and connecting it with our own experience. If a story is applicable, then we will be free to do that ourselves. If a story is an allegory, then you are designed to do it in a particular way. Um, and uh, for the record, you know, Col uh, uh, Tolkien says he cordially dislikes allegory. Uh, for the record, I don't cordially dislike allegory. I love allegory. I think allegory is tremendously fun. Um, I don't feel dominated by an author when I'm reading an allegory. Um, when I'm reading a good allegory, I feel like I feel like I'm I'm playing a, a particularly stimulating kind of intellectual game with an author, and I quite enjoy that game. Um, but uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, Tolkien also, by the way, used allegory um, uh, on several occasions, uh, and there are many ways in which he, uh, with t at times, thinks uh, in allegorical ways. Diego was saying, uh, sort of like Tolkien versus C.S. Lewis. Yes, Lewis also, like me and unlike Tol Tolkien, enjoyed allegory a great deal more. Um, didn't use it much more than Tolkien did. Some, that is, in one sense he did, in that he, unlike Tolkien, wrote one thoroughly and unapologetically allegorical work. Um, which is not the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, it's the Pilgrim's Regress. That is an allegory. If you want to know what an allegory is, that is the kind of allegory that Tolkien was talking about, that kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the authorial domination style of allegory. Um, read C.S. Lewis's The Pilgrim's Regress. It is a thoroughgoing John Bunyan style allegory. Um, and it's cool. Yana, yes, Leaf by Nagel has heavy elements of allegory in it. Um, I think, quite heavy. Um, heavier, indeed, a great deal heavier than the Chronicles of Narnia, which everybody refers to as an allegory, but mostly because they're just using the word allegory rather imprecisely. Um, that Chronicles of Narnia is not an allegory. Uh, but anyway, that's a subject for another time, too. Um, and we can talk about that if... Uh, if the uh, electorate of the Mythgard Academy were to choose a Chronicles of Narnia book, just saying. But anyway, um, <laughs> we're not we're, we're not we're not going there tonight. However, um, I am bringing up the stuff about allegory and applicability uh, because I find it an especially relevant thing to think about in connection with the scouring of the Shire. Um, Look at what Tolkien says. Now, for, wait, before we get to what he says about the scouring of the Shire, one more thing about the allegorical interpretations. As I say, he, in the, in the, in the, the, the foreword, 
is addressing these issues, is addressing the, the interpretations of the Lord of the Rings as allegory of World War II. And he's saying it is not an allegory of World War II. He's saying, I, as author, did nef- did de- definitely did not have World War II in mind. For one thing, that would have been impossible, as I had conceived of the story primarily before the onset of World War II. Um, but, of course, what he goes on to point out is that the readings of The Lord of the Rings that interpret it as an allegory of World War II are not merely simply inaccurate, you know, in the sense of, no, actually, it turns out that wasn't what I was thinking, but I see why, why you could see that. Tolkien's point is, actually, I don't see how you could see that. In fact, <clears throat> you are, you've are you read my story very incompetently if it made you think of World War II, that, you know, absolutely, and have thought nothing about World War II, which would have been odd in someone who had just lived through it. Um, what he points out is, he says, he, you know, how he makes his argument, how he defends his position that it's not an allegory of World War II, is not merely just to assert it from the point of view of the author, no, I didn't do that, but rather, um, you know, he says, look at the story. And look at what happened in World War II. They're nothing alike, right? Had it been an allegory of World War II, here's how the story might have gone, right? But as it didn't go that way, you know, so, and, and, and really, the allegory breaks down almost as soon as you try to articulate it. You know, if Sauron as Hitler and the ring as the atomic bomb, what? How? In what way? I, I mean okay, there's this one crucial thing which can bring about the destruction of the enemy, I guess, but it's, you know, I, I guess the, you know, the, the, the stri- maybe, you know, in some sense, Saruman striving to develop a ring of power and, and, and Sauron having a, I, I guess it's, but it's very vague. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a really poor allegorical reading. It's an allegorical reading that's based on ignorance and laziness. Ignorance both of the story and of history, possibly, um, and, and and also a kind of laziness um, because they're not really thinking it out. Um, they're kind of waving their hands at the idea of an allegory, but if they actually were to sit down and try to spell it out and explain how it works, I think any semi-intelligent person would see it does not really work as an allegory of World War II. You have to put a great deal into it and really twist things around to make it even sound plausible, I think. Um, but I think there's another element there, though. And that is, it's, it's not just ignorance and laziness. It's also anxiety. That is to say, remember that when The Lord of the Rings came out, it was a remarkable phenomenon. That is to say... Tolkien did not invent fantasy, of course. There had been fantasy writers uh, for as long as there have been writers, and they never completely stopped. But Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings was a very big phenomenon um, because it was an adult, uh, you know, an unapologetic fantasy work for adults, which really took off with a popular, with a, you know, a a, a popular appeal, um, which has never really flagged, and which many, many people, millions of people, have found almost completely inexplicable. So you had a lot of people, um, in the especially people who were professional literary critics, looking around, saying to themselves, okay, I don't think this is actually what they were saying to themselves. This is my personal paraphrase of what they were saying to themselves. They're looking around and saying, hmm... I and people like me thought we had stamped this out. <laughs> I thought that we had uh, thoroughly derided this kind of low literature so that nobody would take it seriously. And now here's this thing creeping up, which is much worse than anything we expected. Um, this is uh, this is a terrible disgrace. Anyway, how can we take this kind of fantasy work seriously? There seemed to be, there seemed, seemed to be then, there seems to be now, some real anxiety. Um, uh, uh, on lo- lots of different flavors of anxiety about the reaction, the, the 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 appeal of this kind of fantasy literature for grown-ups, not just for children, but for grown-ups. And so I think that impulse to allegorize is a way to kind of try to deal with that, to try to cope with that. Oh, see, the Lord of the Rings, you know, whether it's done in attack or defense, um, the Lord of the Rings is is not just a fantasy book. I mean, you shouldn't be reading it just as some kind of you know puerile fantasy, you know, fairy tale or something like that. No, no, no. It's a serious 
like it, it must be have it must be having a really profound effect on people. Its popularity can probably be traced to the fact that it's really resonating with these contemporary things, right? So people are seeing in it a a reflection of you know this uh, you know the war that our society has just been through, and so that's totally it's totally explainable. Diego, exactly, it's a rationalization as Diego was just saying. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, or again, people could even try to make that sort of an argument, trying to defend it, right? No, 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 it's not, it's not silly uh, juvenile trash, as so many people were saying about it. Um, no, it's, it's very serious and totally applicable uh, to, our current, uh, to our current world. Well, again, that's both the attack and the defense, I think, are misguided, uh, seriously misguided. But anyway... Nevertheless, that's what was going on. That's what Tolkien is addressing and saying, no, 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 freedom of the reader, not the domination of the author. It's not, about, I, it's, I am not making any allegorical references. I don't want you to, you know, when you're reading my story, I, I, when, you re, when, when you're seeing Gandalf, I, sorry, I don't want you to think about Winston Churchill or whoever he's supposed to be. I want you to be thinking about Gandalf. When you, when you read about Sauron, don't think about Hitler. Um, but instead, you should think about Sauron. Um, look in this context, at what he says about, again, but it's applicable. It's not that it's inappropriate, right? You can certainly read about Sauron and his orcs and think about the Nazis and think, as he often did, about their own side and about the ways in which the Allies also acted rather orcishly on various occasions, as Tolkien was uh, was was quite clear about. Um, but um, but anyway, that you can do. But uh, but uh, but so, but applying it is one thing. Um, trying to get some nugget out of it and uh, throwing away the rest is quite another. But look at what he says about the scouring of the Shire. So he's just been talking about World War Two, World War One, and World War Two, and he's just said that you know you know besides it's not about World War Two anyway. World War One uh, was a far greater influence on me. And the sentence before he had, was the one where he just said by 1918 all but one of my close friends was dead. Or to take a less grievous matter. <laughs> Most things are less grievous than that. It has been supposed by some that the scouring of the Shire reflects the situation in England at the time when I was finishing my tale. It does not. It is an essential part of the plot, foreseen from the outset, though in the event modified by the character of Saruman as developed in the story, without, need I say, any allegorical significance or contemporary political reference whatsoever. It has indeed some basis in experience, though slender, for the economic situation was entirely different, and much further back. The country in which I lived in childhood was being shabbily destroyed before I was ten, in days when motor cars were rare objects, I had never seen one, and men were still building suburban railways. Recently I saw in a paper a picture of the last decrepitude of the once thriving corn mill beside its pool that long ago seemed to me so important. I never liked the looks of the young miller, but his father, the old miller, had a black beard, and he was not named Sandyman. Okay. Um, now, he is giving another instance, right? Now, notice this is a sort of more microscopic in, um, um, instance. That is to say, this is not a reading of the entire story of the Lord of the Rings as an allegory for World, for World War II, but rather it's a particular incident, the scouring of the Shire in this case, which is being interpret, interpreted in this particular way, that it's, you know, that it's reflecting the situation in England at the time when I was finishing my tale. That the scouring of the Shire is like a, a little, you know, it, it's like Orwell's cool. Animal Farm, you know, Tolkien's version of Orwell's Animal Farm, you know, like that kind of a, of a political uh, allegory. And he says, no, it doesn't, right? No allegorical significance or contemporary political reference whatsoever. I would argue, now here's where I'm going to start saying things that are a little bit different from what I've said before. I don't quite believe Tolkien here. Um, that is to say, I don't deny the basic fact. Um, and I, you know, fitting it in the context of the point that he was making before about his resistance to allegory and how he was not thinking of a, you know, that the, you shouldn't be looking around for like which British politicians at, at the time, 
you know, are uh, are Mary and Pippin supposed to represent, and you know, which one is Farmer Cotton, and uh, and uh, you know, which one, you know, and and of course, most importantly, where is Lotho Sackville Baggins? Does he symbolize a particular class or a particular individual? Um, anyway, that kind of political, contemporary political reference or allegorical significance certainly have no problem uh, believing is not there, and that's not what he was thinking. It is certainly, uh, as he says, it fits in with the story. It is an essential part of the plot foreseen from the outset, he says. That makes sense to me. I can easily believe that. right? It certainly does fit. This, and I, I, Not objecting to any of that, but I think that when people when people look at you know I, I I said that the reading of of the Lord of the Rings as a whole as an allegory of World War II is something which really can only be held um, by somebody who's who's ignorant or lazy or both. Um, I don't think that's true. Not in the same way of the Scouring of the Shire. The Scouring of the Shire is a different kind of a situation. Um, no contemporary political reference whatsoever. None at all? Really? See, The Scouring of the Shire, to me, does, in fact, bear some of the markers of allegory. It has some of those things that, you know, um, remember, um, again, just earlier on in this same preface when he's talking about allegory, the phrase he uses is very memorable. He says, uh, I've always cordially disliked allegory ever since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. Well, my allegory detectors kind of go off in the Scouring of the Shire. I'm not going to lie. They kind of do. Um, this sounds and feels like allegory. It is certainly a- applicable, and we can apply it however we want. We- no, except I don't think we can apply it however we want. This is a part of the book much more than many other parts of the book, very much more than other parts of the book, which seems to want to be applied in a particular way. Um, again, he has just recently said in this, uh, earlier on in the foreword, um, uh, as for any, uh, you know, meaning or message, it has in the intention of the author none. No, no, again, the whole, of the whole story of the Lord of the Rings, I, that, I, I agree. That's, again, he's not just making a political point. Can the same thing be said of the Scouring of the Shire? I'm not saying that it can't be applied by different people in different ways, that it has no other kind of applicability, but can we really read The Scouring of the Shire and say that it has... and say that we can really believe that it has no message or meaning in the intention of the author? Well, I myself don't believe that. It does, in fact, seem to have a message and a meaning. Um, uh, And... Moreover, what makes it different for me to the rest, to other parts of the Lord of the Rings, is that the the message, the terms, the issues that are going on there in the Scouring of the Shire, are very much relevant to the political situation of 20th century England in ways which are not true of, say, the Return of the King's uh, plot, you know, down in Minas Tirith, for instance, right? That's no, or the situation in Rohan and the restoration of King Theoden, right? I don't read the, the you know, when Gandalf comes in and heals King Theoden, this sets off none of my allegory censors, right? Um, you know, I, I've got some radar for allegory, nothing, I'm, I'm, I'm getting nothing there. I'm getting nothing in Minas Tirith. In the scouring of the Shire, I got, I got, I got alarms going off all over the place, right? Because those issues, what's at stake there in the scouring of the Shire is, to some extent, or we, like, some of the things, not like the major issue of 20th century England, but um, but rather, I mean, this was something clearly that Tolkien cared about. We see him talking about a lot in his letters. Um, he does have a message, and it does seem to have, to use his phrase, contemporary political significance, like, if not specific reference in these ways. Um, uh, Ed says his language in the scouring is identical to the language used in the post post war period by British politicians. It's a philosophical and linguist and linguistic reference, not an allegory. I agree again. I'm not saying that it is an allegory in the in the in the rigid sense. For it to be an allegory, you would have to be able to unpack it 
That is to say, certain characters would either represent particular people or they would represent particular values or virtues. Um, you know, we'd have to be able, like if it were a moral allegory, we'd have to be able to say something like, uh, you know, Mary represents fortitude, whereas, you know, uh, I, uh, Frodo represents mercy. Uh, and that doesn't work. Obviously, it's not that kind of an allegory. Um, but, um, but again, it's not... I don't think that this is an example quite of the reader being left perfectly free. If the reader wanted to... Um, come away from the scouring of the Shire saying the way I would apply this text is in a uh, pro-fascist direction. I would say they, well, they're really not so free to do, I mean, you can do, you can do anything you want, uh, uh, but um, it's uh, very difficult to do that. Um, and I don't think the text really leaves, really quite leaves you free uh, to do that. Um, uh, <laughs> Yana thinks that Lotho is Winston Churchill. Possibly. Possibly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Rebecca says everyone is free to be as wrong as they want. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Um, anyway, let me explain a little bit more what I mean about the kind of... What should we say? Uh forced applicability, <laughs> mandatory <laughs> applicability. Uh, let me let me let me stop being abstract and let's look at the text here. Uh, I'll come back to that. Here we go. Um, it all began with Pimple, as we call him, said Farmer Cotton, and it began as soon as you'd gone off, Mr. Frodo. He'd funny ideas at Pimple. Seems he wanted to own everything himself, and then order other folk about. It soon came out that he already did own a sight more than was good for him, and he was always grabbing more, though where he got the money was a mystery. Mills and malt houses and inns and farms and leaf plantations. He'd already bought Sandyman's mill before he came to Bag End, seemingly. Of course, he started with a lot of property in the South Farthing which he had from his dad, and it seems he'd been selling a lot of the best leaf and sending it away quietly for a year or two. But at the end of last year he began sending away loads of stuff, not only leaf, Things began to get short, and winter coming on, too. Folk got angry, but he had his answer. A lot of men, ruffians mostly, came with great wagons, some to carry off the goods south, south away, and others to stay. And more came. And before we knew where we were, they were planted here and there all over the Shire, and were felling trees and digging and building themselves sheds and houses just as they liked. At first, goods and damage were paid for by Pimple, but soon they began lording it around and taking what they wanted. Okay. What has happened? <laughs> Gnome says, Pimple is the 1%. Uh, ge careful, careful. Uh, uh, contemporary political <laughs> reference that is not contemporary with us. Um, d not allegory. Don't try to find out who Lotho Pimple really is. <laughs> no, Tom, it's not Rupert Murdoch. No, no, no. What's the issue here? What is he depicting? Now, I want to break the scouring of the Shire, or at least, I, that is to say, I want to, I want to break down the problems in the Shire, which, uh, which bring about the scouring, into two phases, which I think it's important for us to keep distinct. The first is the pimple stage, and the second is the sharky stage, because it's fairly clear that those are discrete stages. They're related to each other but they're discrete stages. So I'm st I'm st I'm, we're starting here, uh, you know, in this passage, I want to focus only on the pimple stage. What do we see happening in the Shire in the pimple stage? The pimple party would be a really great political movement, I think. Um, I, I, I want to, I want to hear, uh, I want to hear your, your analysis here. What, what went wrong? And what is the ideology behind this version of the story? Okay, Arthur says, modernization, the industrial revolution, the fall of the aristocracy. Fall of the aristocracy, we don't see emphasis. I mean, there's some of that comes out. I mean, you think of the Tooks, right? Um, you know, if anyone's going to play a chief at this time of day uh, in the Shire, it's going to be the right thane of the Shire and no upstart. Um, so you can see some clash with traditional uh, aristocracy there. 
But that's certainly not, I think, the main emphasis. It's certainly not the story that Farmer Cotton primarily tells. Um, modernization, industrialization, yes, it's not because it's not quite gone quite so far as industrial, but we certainly see the fingerprints of industrialization, or rather, we see the forebodings of industrialization, right? Lotho Pimple has made one step towards industrialization. He wants to build bigger, better mills that can grind more corn, right? More can grind more and faster. And it is associated, uh, as Morgan points out, with unrestrained capitalism, right? He'd already own, he already did own a good site more than was good for him. Um, how about that for a principle? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting way of applicable idea in our world, right? The idea that some people can, in fact, just be too rich than is good for them. It is not good uh, for a small number of people to own so much. Now, in part, this is a more, you know, a, a, a piece of moral applicability, a piece that is available, given to us for moral applicability, right? Um, about avarice and greed, and, you know, we can think back to the dragon sickness of the Shire. But, um, but there's clearly more here than just that kind of sort of abstract or depoliticized um, moral application. This is a heavily politicized moral application. Um, Alyssa says we see the aggregation of resources more on the lines of capitalism's magnates than aristocracy. Yes. Um, Lotho is the... He, he's he, You know, his actions are the foreboding of the Industrial Revolution. They are also, uh, you know, the first steps and several steps down the road to, you know, the 19th century tycoons, right? You know, he's a, he's a Carnegie, he's a Rockefeller, uh, uh, you know, in, in, well, not even in embryo, uh, in, 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 in fetus at least, right? Um, and good, Kristen, we see how his desire to, uh, to, to own things, um, correlates with his desire for power. Um, his desire to own things and to give orders to others. Um, and this is, as Luke points out, this is seen as progress, right? That is, um, you know, uh, the, the language that the new bosses of the Shire use, boss, another very weighted word um, in the context of the Industrial Revolution, um, but anyway, the, the, the language that we see the boss is using um, is about progress, right? Um, yeah. Now, Rebecca, again, I'm not arguing that this is an allegory. But again, I'm also arguing that we're not completely free to apply this in any way that we want. Um, nor do I quite believe Tolkien if he were to tell me, as he seems to be doing in his foreword, that he has no particular meaning or message. I think he does have a message. I think he does have a particular meaning that he's conveying here in the scouring of the Shire. Keep in mind, I'm not saying that's bad. I quite like his message, and I think it's I think it's conveyed really skillfully. I, for one, of course, I like allegory to begin with more than he does, so I'd never had the qualms at all that he had. Um... I have no objection to this. I think he does it very, very well. And I like this kind of thing. But um, but I think it's kind of undeniable that it's actually going on. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a, a couple people. Um, Arthur, I think... And uh, Timothy and Ed are pointing out that the language of gathering and sharing um, is that of the socialist politicians after World War II. Um, that is very, very socialist, the gathering and sharing. Um, but wait, let's, let's, um, let's, let's hang on to that a little bit, because we are moving more towards... Um, that begins to transition us toward, as, as Arthur was pointing out, the Sharky phase. Um, it starts with Pimple, and Pimple's primary focus seems to be industrialization, um, uh, capitalism. He's a capitalist. 
um, though he though he he seems to be the innovator of that sort of that that socialist language of gathering and sharing, um, though much more gathering than sharing is done. Um, but um, yeah, what well, Tom? No, he does say there's no message. Um, as you know, that's how he begins. Uh, that, that's how he starts. And again, I'm not I'm not trying to make a big deal about like Tolkien was dishonest or you know he misled us. No, I, I I understand what he's trying to do here, and I appreciate his message in the forward. Um, I think that it at the very least it has done so much good um, to help to. Uh, argue with people who want to make boneheaded allegories out of the Lord of the Rings, but um, but again, I think it's important that we not shut our eyes to things that we can see. And in the Scouring of the Shire, I think it's it's there's a lot of stuff that's pretty um, that's pretty clear. Um, yeah, and Ed, Ed, you're right. I I, I, I don't want to oversimplify things. Ed points out. He says. Uh, you know, to Ed is wanting to recall that back then industrialization is associated with the left, that is, with the socialist side, just as much as the right. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Rebecca says he seemed to caution people against stopping reading the story and starting uh, to read it as if it were a sermon. I agree, Rebecca, exactly. Um, and I think that and and again that's certainly i think very importantly true of the lord of the rings as a whole but again my whole point here this evening is that i think in the scouring of the shire more so than anywhere else that i think in the lord of the rings we do get some sermonizing here um cuz what comes of it what do, if if you the common people are not on your guard this uh in these you know these capitalist impulses these these uh, you know this the industrialization the acquisitiveness and uh uh concomitant power hungriness of people like Lotho Pimple um uh, if you start off with that where does it end up Sharky right look at the emphasis look at how Saruman explains what he was doing here um, Sarma has just said that you didn't expect to see, to find me here. I did not, said Frodo, but I might have guessed. A little mischief in a mean way. Gandalf warned me that you were still capable of it. Quite capable, said Saruman, and more than a little. You made me laugh, you hobbit lordlings, riding along with all those great people, so secure and so pleased with your little selves. You thought you had done very well out of all of it, and could now just amble back and have a nice quiet time in the country. Saruman's home could be all wrecked, and he could be turned out, but no one could touch yours. Oh no, Gandalf would look, at, look after your affairs. Saruman laughed again. Not he. When his tools have done their task, he drops them. But you must go dangling after him, dawdling and talking and riding round twice as far as you needed. Well, thought I, if they're such fools, I will get ahead of them and teach them a lesson. One ill turn deserves another. It would have been a sharper lesson if only you had given me a little more time and more men. Still, I have already done much that you will find it hard to mend or undo in your lives, and it will be pleasant to think of that and set, against, set it against my injuries." Well, if that is what you find pleasure in, said Frodo, I pity you. It will be a pleasure of memory only, I fear. Go at once and never return. Okay. What do we see here? I'm thinking here especially about Saruman's expressed motivations for what he was doing, first of all. What's the difference between the Pimple regime and the Sharky regime? How are they connected with each other? And what do we learn from this? As you can see, what I'm essentially doing is inviting us... Uh, what I'm essentially doing is inviting us to do the interpretation, which I think we... I feel invited to do. That's what, that's what happens. Again, I don't object when my allegory alarms go off. I quite, I quite like it. Um, but when my allegory alarms feel off, I feel invited to interpret, um, and that's and I, I I think we can we can we can see that here. Um, uh, 
Arthur says, okay, so if Pimple is primarily associated, as we see in the in the beginning of his story, to the beginning of his story, as Farmer, I uh, almost called him Farmer Maggot, as Farmer Cotton tells us, uh, is associated with greed, um, and Sharky with pure hatred and desire for vengeance. He seeks to destroy the Shire simply out of spite. Right? He is not even being acquisitive. He's not trying to gain, he's not trying to aggrandize himself in any way, though he clearly likes power and he likes being the new boss. But um, but that's not his goal, right? His goal is pure destructive, pure malice, pure spite. Uh, and Arthur says, uh, you know, is Tolkien suggesting that that the one leads to the other? Um, yes, yes. Um, as Noam puts out, it doesn't start out of spite, but it gets there. Um, Rebecca says, beware of getting involved with interests you don't understand for your own gain. Yes, Rebecca, the same application could be made here for, uh, you know, t- uh, Saruman messing with the Palantir and trying to spy on Mordor. In doing that, he was uh, overreaching himself. Um, he was uh, getting involved in things that were above him. But uh, he... And the same thing with Denethor, right? Perilous to any, uh, you know, is the uh, is is an art which is um, mangling that quotation. Somebody help me remember. I, I, want, I, I, I want to make sure I get it right. I hate it when I misquote things. But, uh, perilous... Somebody give it to me. Anyway... Alyssa, can you type that for me? <laughs> I know you know it. Uh, I can always count on Alyssa. Is Robert here? Oh, Robert's not here. Oh. Robert Brown. Okay, anyway. Yes, uh, perilous to, it's, to, it's perilous to study too closely the arts of... Anyway, somebody will get it to me and then I'll, and then, and, and then I'll read it out. But anyway, um, Rebecca, getting back to your point, Lotho is doing the same thing, right? He is following in Saruman's footsteps, but he also doesn't understand. Um, he also is, um, he, you know, he becomes Saruman's tool, just as Saruman, in turn, had become Sauron's tool. Um, so yeah, we do see, we do see that, that, uh, that progression. Um, yeah, Brent says it's interesting to see how Gandalf's dealing with the hobbits are completely different from Saruman's, though, as Alyssa points out, Saruman himself doesn't understand that, right? He tries to characterize Gandalf as acting in precisely the same way that he would act, right? Remember Gandalf saying to him, I fear that I am beyond your comprehension, um, and that seems to be clearly true. Um, Thank you, Carissa. It is perilous to study too deeply the art... Wait, no, wait, no, no, that, that's not the one. Uh, too deeply the arts of the enemy for good or ill. Yeah, that's what Gandalf says at the uh, at, at the uh, at the council. But no, no, it's the other quotation I'm thinking, and I think it's about Denethor. Um, perilous to any is the, the study of an art that is greater than... Um, I'm forgetting the wording. Anyway, it's going to really bother me, to, but I don't want to make you wait as I sit here and look it up. Um... Yeah. Yeah, good sorry, I'm just reading comments here. Um Don uh uh Don Standing points out that there's an interesting sort of an element of childishness almost in both of the um the the evil actions, both Pimple and Sharky here, um, that Saruman's spite is the childish consequence of not getting one's own way, uh, and Lotho's, you know, is, it's a very simple-minded kind of vindictiveness. Um, I agree. Lotho's greed is childish gluttony. Um, both reflect a lack of understanding of the reality of a situation. I'm not sure gluttony is the right image that I would use. Um, but, um, yeah, Sarah, at the same time, was saying it reminds me of um, C.S. Lewis's depiction of evil not as a grand thing, but as a petty thing. Um, yes, yes. Um, yes, I agree. Um, anyway, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, to merely fixate on, you know, sort of the 
the ways in which this passage does seem to be, um, you know, a, a more sermonish than than uh, is usual in Tolkien, um, and a sermon along the lines of the dangers of the industrializing and sort of progressive mindset, um, this new fangledness that Lotho has, the way that he is changing traditional values, uh, and uh, and in the particular direction in which he's taking them, and how those lead to uh, to power hungriness, and then ultimately to wanton destructiveness. The kind of you know, and you think of the way that uh, that Sandyman, that Ted Sandyman, has been perverted, has been corrupted, um, and th- you know, Frodo's really sort of pitying words um, for about uh, Ted Sandyman. Um, and how he, you know, you think of you know, the way that Ted Sandyman has totally bought into um, this new world, and the way that he himself has been made into a slave, but is bragging about it, right? Um, that whole mindset, you know, where you have the, uh, you know, in many ways, the the four travelers are an outside force in this, right? Within the Shire, um, in my mind, you don't have Lotho is not. A pole because he's a more he's more singular than that. Um, though he's the impulse, the impetus that starts the whole thing. Um, to me, the poles are are you know Farmer Cotton on the one side and Ted Sandyman on the other side. Um, and yeah, exactly. Though Ted's father used to be his own master um, before apparently they sold out to Lotho, um, presumably out of greed. Right, that must have been why um, Lotho must have paid a good deal for the mill. Mills, I mean, in in you know, in a pre-industrial society, millers were really important people. I, I mean, you had a complete monopoly on the ability to turn grain into flour. I mean, to, you know, to, it's up to you whether or not, and the entire you know, everybody in the district uh, can make bread out of their grain. Um, so that used to be, you know, Ted's father used to be not only his own master but a person of pretty significant importance. Um, anyway, but he sold out. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, I love the. Um, <laughs> Yana says, as a guide at our local windmill, I can attest to this. Uh, yeah, well, of course, Miller's were, um, you know, uh, uh, English students, of course, may remember Chaucer's Miller, um, who's kind of a, a, sort of, in some ways, a parody of the type. Um, Miller's are are famously corrupt because they had a monopoly and often exploited it. Um, and, you know, so we can see, you know, within the tradition uh the uh, the the um, the kind of prominence and the kind of power, the crooked power in some ways that Miller's uh, had or could have. Anyway, um, I really love the way in which you guys are pointing out different applicabilities and different things that we can get and we can see here, and uh, I think it's 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 a wonderful. Sort of creates it's 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 a wonderful not exactly a corrective but it's a an, a wonderful addition. Although I do believe, as I said, that I think that there is clearly a message here. That there is, I think, a message that Tolkien wanted to say that had everything to do with contemporary British society. Not necessarily that he was doing an allegorical description of that society, but that he had a message for that society or a word of caution for that society, which was very relevant to the political discussions of his time. Um, however, this story isn't just that. Um, that's why I, I have no objection to seeing this kind of sermonizing going on, because he does it really, really well. Um, and wh- what I mean by that is not only does he sermonize very effectively, uh, but he also manages to tell a story which has still this further richness of apl- of applicability that you guys have been pointing to, and also that it remains still a really good story. That this is not something that, uh, if you are missing that message, uh, then it's really not worth reading or not a very interesting... It's a wonderful story on its own, and if you completely ignore uh, the sermonizing, 
you don't lose anything from the story itself. Um, so, anyway, yeah, exactly, Luke. It remains a story and isn't just a sermon. It's both. And that's what really good allegories tend to be. So I like it. Again, not an allegory. I shouldn't have said that. Really good allegories tend to do that, and this one does all, and this story does that also. Um, okay. All right, one last thing, and then we'll move on. This is not exactly related to that, but I, I couldn't get this other passage out of my mind when I was thinking about Pimple and Sharky and the new age and the progress that's coming to the Shires. We have a very interesting point of contrast um, when they're staying in Bree and trying to explain the new world that's coming to, uh, to Butterbur. And there is a king again, Barlaman. He will soon be turning his mind this way. Then the green way will be opened again, and his messengers will come north, and there will be comings and goings, and the evil things will be driven out of the wastelands. Indeed, the waste in time will be waste no longer, and there will be people and fields where once there was wilderness. Mr. Butterbur shook his head. If there's a few decent, respectable folk on the roads, that won't do no harm, he said. But we don't want no more rabble and ruffians, and we don't want no outsiders at Bree, nor near Bree at all. We want to be let alone. I don't want a whole crowd of strangers camping here and settling there and tearing up the wild country. You will be let alone, Barlamin, said Gandalf. There is room enough for realms between Eisen and Greyflood, or along the, the shoreland south of the Brandywine, without anyone living within many days' ride of Bree. And many folk used to dwell away north, a hundred miles or more from here, at the far end of the Greenway, on the north downs or by a lake Evendim. "'Up away by dead men's dyke,' said Butterbur, looking even more dubious. "'That's haunted land, they say. None but a robber would go there.' "'The rangers go there,' said Gandalf. "'Dead men's dyke, you say. So it has been called for long years. But its right name, Barlamin, is Fornost Erin, Norbury of the Kings. And the king will come there again one day, and then you'll have f some fair folk riding through.' "'We get here. "'Ah, Dime, thank you. That's it!' Perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. That's it. Thank you, Dime. I can now sleep tonight uh, without looking that up as soon as class is done. Perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. That is, in fact, what I was thinking of. Thanks, Dime. Um, okay. Um, anyway. Okay. Thanks. Totally lost my train of thought, but I appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, okay, okay. Uh, compare and contrast. This is another vision of, of progress, right? And here it's the good guys. It's Gandalf on, you know, talking about what Aragorn is going to do, saying, hey, a new era has come, right? Um, and there's going to be, there's going to be progress. There's going to be change. And there's going to be not industrialization, but increased civilization, right? The waste is not going to, the wilderness is going to be, you know, is going to be mown down and there's going to be towns and farmlands and uh, people are going to move in here. Um, Luke says it's not technological process, but progress, but social progress, yes. Yeah, now, again, I, I, obviously I'm not trying to suggest, like, really, these two things are the same. Obviously they're not the same. You know, what the new age of the king that Gandalf is describing is quite different from either the Pimple era or the Sharky era in the Shire. But, but I think it's a very interesting parallel. Notice that Barlamin is the one who is voicing the conservative point of view, right? That is conservative in the sense of being resistant to change. Right? He doesn't want things to change. But it's not just that he doesn't want things to change. Some of the things, sentiments that he expresses seem to be uh, ones which are at least very, very, very consonant with the anti-pimple point of view in the Shire. Um, I don't want to see a whole crowd of strangers camping here and settling there and tearing up the wild country. Yeah, the not, I mean, tearing up the wild country is what Lotho had the men doing, right? They're coming in, and, and then Sharky's really tearing it up. Uh, now, obviously, there are differences, right? Um, Rebecca says, not the wilderness. Not the wilderness. The wastes. Yes. The waste, indeed, will be waste no longer. 
right? Uh, certainly, linguistically, that is an important distinction. Rebecca, I agree. Um, Rebecca adds, wilderness is where wild things live. Wastes are where evil things fester. Um, yes, the evil things will be driven out of the wastelands. Yes, that is a big difference. So that's one... Um, that certainly is one major change that we have. There's a there's a very long ways between the desolation of the Shire, or attempted or partial desolation of the Shire, and the um, and the 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 clearing away of the evil creature. You know, the the removal of the evil creatures uh, and replacing of it with fair folk. Who come through to establish Norbury of the re-establish Norbury of the Kings, um, bringing prosperity and order to wild places, and as Rachel points out, governed by a king, right? Not a boss, but a king, um, and that is different. And of course, Rachel also points out that although it is a king, um, you know they're going to have a monarch. Yet the folk in the existing towns will have a say. This is clearly, you know, Bree will be respected and not simply dominated. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, Joshua makes a really good point, I think. Would it be more, uh, more a, a, a case of restoration rather than revolution? Um, yes, this is not progress in Lotho's sense, right? Um, in the Lotho Sandiman sense. Um, let's leave the old ways and do things differently. Let's grind corn more efficiently. Let's reorder our economic system um, so that everything works more efficiently. And by the way, as a side effect, so that I have everything and you have less, right? Um, and let's, uh, you know, so let's, let's gather and share so that everybody um, operates alike, but that, um, but, but actually more gathering than sharing goes on. So under the cloak of socialism, um, because of course Lotho is not really a socialist, it does not seem, um, what we're actually going to have is a totalitarian state, which, oh, is exactly what happens when Sharky shows up. Um, anyway, very different from that, right? Very different from that is what we see being being described here. Um, restoration, Joshua, I think is a really good way to talk about it. That's what Gandalf emphasizes, right? Um, we have both of these two things. The, the thing that Rebecca was emphasizing, um, that we have this very clear moral dimension here in this, sto in this version here. Um, we have the evil things who, are, who live in the wastelands. And the evil things will be driven out, and the wastelands will be waste no longer. Um, and it's not going to be Dead Men's Dyke anymore. It's not going to be haunted uh, by ghosts. Instead, it is going to be, uh, and possibly only, vi and possibly visited by robbers. Instead, it is going to be, uh, you know, a flourishing and wholesome city of fair folk. It's going to be Norbury of the Kings, and as Joshua points out. That's not progress, that's restoration. Um, we're going to be returning to a happier time, not just moving forward um, in a direction which is going to be called progress. Um, Carissa says you could say it will be protected by a king rather than being ruled by a boss. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, is the king going to rule? Yeah, yeah, the king is going to rule. But again, we, we can see, certainly Gandalf is emphasizing the difference. Um, you know, you think about the way that Bill Fernie talks about, you know, and the way that the the way that all of the ruffians in the Shire that we meet talk about how this this country needs setting to rights, right? Um, the people need to be kept under control. They need to be, uh, you know, they need to be brought into line. They need to be oppressed and suppressed. The king is going to leave Bree alone, right? Um, uh, and of course, we see very dramatically. Uh, Aragorn leaving the Shire alone by passing and himself personally observing the law that no uh, no humans, no big people, are going to be going into the Shire. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Luke, you know, I think that's a perfectly fair point. Luke says, order 
uh, is a loaded word for him, thinking of Saruman's prior use. Yeah, I, that's the thing. It's what I find so interesting about this passage. Although you can see the obvious differences between this version of, you know, progress towards a new era and the the pimpled, sharky versions of progress towards a new era. The differences are, 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 are very glaring, but they're not wholly unconnected. When we put these in parallel next to each other, we can see there are similarities, right? Again, it's not saying they're the same, but we can see there's um, the two impulses are not totally different. Um, restoration and revolution aren't the opposite of each other, right? They're two impulses which diverge, but but are going in the same direction. Um, anyway, um, yeah, as Tom says, knowledge, rule, and order can be realized in a good or bad way. Yeah, none of the three things that Saruman holds as his ideals, knowledge, rule, and order, none of them are bad things. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's like the moral of the story is that uh, to be anti-order, anti-rule, and anti-knowledge, um, it's all about Saruman's own application, right? Okay, as several people are noticing, we've no, we've not gotten on very far with Appendix A yet. There's a lot I'm going to leave in Appendix A. But I hope to come back to some of it next time too. Um, one thing I wanted to to do, and I want I wanted to start with this, even though it's not the beginning of Appendix A, um, but I did want to I did want to start with this because it connects quite directly with some of the conversations we were having um, about the the you know about Book Six, um, and in particular our class session when we were discussing the first three chapters, the trip, the final trip to Mount Doom, um, you know, the uh, the Samwise uh, class session, um, and in particular when we were looking at hope and Sam's hope and his relationship with hope. I wanted to come back to that because the story of Aragorn and Arwen um, is very explicitly deals with these issues of hope. Um, so I want to come back to the uh, to those again because they, they connect with some of our previous discussions. But, um, but I want to um, then we'll, we'll come back to sort of the more sort of broader history stuff probably next time. We're going to be a little realistic here. We're going to come, come back to that next time. And I would encourage you, you're always encouraged to do this, but I want to especially encourage you as we prepare for next week. Um, next week is going to, is our final official class, uh, session, our final scheduled class session, um, where we'll do some more, uh, on Appendix A and then look at the rest of the appendices too. I strongly encourage you to email me. Do have particular questions, particular issues from the appendices that you'd like to talk about? I would love to, uh, I, I have a little bit less of an agenda, uh, moving forward looking, and there's some things that I, that I would, you know, some general things that I would like to emphasize, but I would be very happy. Um, to be guided by your own interests and questions uh, as we're th as you're thinking about the appendices, um, but anyway, um, let's. So, but, the, but before we do that, uh, uh, I, I I hope you will indulge me to talk about hope a little bit because I think it's really awesome what happens in the story of Aragorn and Arwen. So let's look at this first. Um, this is a passage not from The Return of the King at all, but from uh, Volume 10 of the History of Middle-earth called Morgoth's Ring, which um, looks backwards in my picture. Um, this is from the story called uh, the, the, the Athrobeth, the, 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 the debate between Finrod and Endreth. Um, and I strongly recommend the Athrobeth, um, if you haven't read it before. Um, it's a remarkable piece. It's a debate between Finrod, the Elf Lord, and Andreth, a wise woman of men. And it is specifically dealing with the doom of men, or the gift of men, and their relationship with that. I'm not going to go in too much into Andreth, because I could talk about that for a long time, and that would be really... Um, uh, a digression, but I'm giving this because uh, 
here we see, and we talked about two different kinds of hope, and Tolkien defines those things very clearly here in this passage. So I want to refer to this because it gives us the vocabulary that we need uh, to talk about this. And now you might ask, why didn't we do this earlier? Because the vocabulary wasn't explicitly used. Here in the story of Aragorn and Arwen, we get the actual elvish word Estelle. So I wanted to bring it in here. Have ye then no hope? said Finrod. What is hope? she said. An expectation of good, which, though uncertain, has some foundation in what is known. That's her definition of hope, right? An an expectation of good, which, though uncertain, has some foundation in what is known. It's an interesting definition. But if that's the definition, then no. Then we have none, she says. "That That is one thing that men call hope, said Finrod. Amdir, we call it, looking up. But there is another, which is founded deeper. Estelle, we call it, that is, trust. It is not defeated by the ways of the world, for it does not come from experience, but from our nature and first being. If we are indeed the Eruhin, the children of the One, then he will not suffer himself to be deprived of his own, not by any enemy, not even by ourselves. This is the last foundation of Estel, which we keep even when we contemplate the end, for all his designs, the issue must be for his children's joy. Am dear, you have not, you say. Does no Estel at all abide? So you see the distinction that Finrod is making here. Um, Luke says, wow, this is Christian theology. Yeah, um, yes. The Athrabeth is, for my money, the most explicitly Christian Middle-earth piece Tolkien ever wrote. Um, uh, Luke, if you haven't read it, you will be even more surprised in the very next page uh, to find a character within Middle-earth talking about anticipating the Incarnation explicitly, when Eru himself shall, def- when, when the One himself shall come down and enter into um, uh, the world, e- enter into history. But anyway, the theology, the larger theology, or the, rather the specific theology, is not what I want to primarily emphasize. The primary point here is the difference between Amdir and Estel. And as you see, this is very much the uh, the difference that we were seeing. This is the the, the sort of the, the hope dichotomy that we were already observing in The Return of the King, when we saw Sam... Losing his Amdir, right? His Amdir dies on that day that he drops his pans down the pit, right? When he realizes we're not coming back from the mountain. There is no... It's not possible. There is a 0% chance that, barring some kind of miracle, um, we're going to be able to make it back from the mountain. If we can get there, it's the most that we can do, and then we're going to die there. At that moment, his Amdir dies, he has no, but he hasn't lost Estelle. Estelle is the hope that he has when he sees the star. That, you know, in that passage that we looked at before. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, when he sees the star and has that much broader realization, that much more, um, you know, that sort of that 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 worldview moment when he realizes that the shadow is but a small and passing thing, and that there is always light and high beauty beyond its reach. That is the found... That realization, that understanding, that worldview, is the basis for his Estelle, for his hope. Um, And that's why he turns and has that moment where he, in trust, goes to sleep, right? Trusting that things are going to work out. Um, he, He... steps forward in pure Estelle in that moment. Um, Erica, I wouldn't exactly define Estelle as trust in God. I mean, trust in God is Estelle, but I don't think that's quite a full enough... Again, we don't see that in Sam exactly. Sam doesn't seem to be thinking about God. It's not Sam's vocabulary. He would never say that. Um, He's not thinking of a deity. He's thinking of the world as it is. Not from his experience. Again, that's the distinction, notice, that Finrod is making. Amdir, 
um, defined by Andref is an expectation of good which, though uncertain, has some foundation in what is known. Um, that's, if that's the definition of Amdir, of looking up, thinking that things are going to turn out well for you. Um, that, again, that's not what Sam... Sam does have that, too, but he, that's what he loses. Um, yeah, but, but, but again, he... Backtracking. The distinction that Finrod is making is between the hope that is based on experience and the hope that is not based on experience, but rather from our nature and first being. Um, another way of putting that... Again, Finrod is not saying only Estelle is trust in God, but it is faith. That's why he uses the word trust. The word faith, you may recall is the word that I was using, and I used this also in the Two Towers class when we were talking about this, when I was um, talking about the bases for the choice that people make. We see uh, Aragorn acting in faith. We see Frodo acting in faith. Again, not faith in God. That's not the vocabulary um, of the Lord of the Rings. None of the characters think that way. Those aren't the terms. It's not to say that it's irrelevant to faith in God, because it clearly is relevant to faith in God. But again, that's not the vocabulary that Tolkien uses, and I think that that's important. Sam realizes that, to use a more Tolkienian metaphor, um, his hope, his Estelle that he has when he's looking up at the star, is him sort of coming into harmony with the way the world is. Um, his recognizing the fact that light and beauty are the higher things, are the things that exist. Um, Gollum, in his darkness riddle, suggests that darkness is the ultimate reality. That the world and light and life and warmth and laughter and everything is just a parenthesis in the middle of darkness, surrounded and engulfed and ultimately in the end consumed by darkness. Um, you know, it comes first and follows after, kills life, ends laughter. That's Gollum's worldview as expressed in that riddle. Um, Sam comes at that moment to a very opposite worldview, that darkness is not what is outside everything. Light and beauty is what is outside everything. Now again, Erica, he doesn't use explicitly religious or even theistic uh, vocabulary there when he's thinking about it. It's very relevant, but that's uh, but that's not how he would talk about it. Um, uh, now, Finrod is much more theological because he's met the Valar and has studied more theology uh, than Sam has. Um, Timothy says, "Is it trust? It's trust in someone, however vast that someone is." No, I, I don't want you to think I'm resisting a Christian reading. I think it's, it's it's this is the treatment of hope is to me one of the things that is most profoundly uh, resonant with Christianity. One of the ways. I mean, if people, you know, do I think? The Lord of the Rings is based on on a fundamental, on a fundamentally Christian worldview. I would say yes. Uh, ask to illustrate that the treatment of hope is one of the primary things I would point to um, as an illustration of that. So I, again, I don't want you to think that I am just sort of trying to, to to quibble about that. But again, I think it's important not to skip steps. I don't think that Sam is showing trust in someone. Finrod is again. He knows about the one. Sam doesn't know about the one. Um, as far as we know, there is no religion in that way in The Lord of the Rings. Um, s what Sam gets is a glimpse of a worldview. A worldview which would... Um, which makes him a sort of... gives him a kind of a pre-Christian worldview. Um, that is to say, a worldview which... If someone came along and told Sam, ah, you know, do you know, you know, Sam would sit down and talk theology here, would talk, you know, okay, you believe the world is like this, you have trust, you know, in this light and high beauty that you have perceived that this is the world. Why do you think the world is like that? You know, who may, you know, would he be 
would he be thinking about it that way? Um, or would he be open to that kind of discussion? I don't know. Uh, probably he would. Um, but again, that's not; those aren't the terms of the Lord of the Rings. I don't think that we have any evidence that Sam is thinking in those kind of theological ways. Um, but... Timothy says, trust in the order of the universe then? Yeah, in some ways. In some ways. Um, trust that it's not the nature of evil to triumph in the end, asked Sarah. Yes, yes. Um, I don't think Sam knows exactly what he's trusting in. But I would say, I think that that's exactly what Tolkien would say you would expect in a pre-Christian culture, which is what he's describing, right? This is the world of Middle-earth is, with some exceptions, um, like Goadriel and Elrond, for instance, who have had, in, who have actually met, you know, immortal <laughs> divinities, uh, and, and, uh, had the opportunity to talk with them, Goadriel more than Elrond. Um, but anyway, the majority of people in Middle-earth are unlearned. They don't know about... Why do they not stand and do that prayer thing that the Numenorians do, you know, that, that, that Faramir and his company does, you know, which makes Frodo feel all rustic and untutored? Why don't they do that? Because they don't know about that, right? They don't think about that. It's not part of their cultural understanding. They are, they are ignorant, not meaning that word is an insult, of these things. Um, but, nevertheless, they see the they perceive nevertheless these truths um, Sam is perceiving a truth when he is lying there in Mordor and seeing the star twinkling up overhead um, yeah yeah um, anyway let me get back to uh, let me get back back to the text here uh, and I, and I, I apologize um, um I, I apologize for for not being able to get to everybody's comments. Well, lots of people are making comments, uh, and I know this is opening. This opens a really big bag of, uh, I almost said bag of worms, which is just doesn't make. Who keeps worms in a bag? Nobody. I guess you keep them in a can, right? Um, obviously, that's where you would keep your worms. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Erica, then let me come back to one question that you, or the one point that you're making here. Um, Erica says, uh, the passage comes across, this passage, I assume the Athrobath passage you mean, comes across as bad things won't happen because God won't let them happen, which makes no sense. No, I don't think that's what Finrod is saying. That's, in fact, in, in one way he's saying the opposite of that. That's what he means by saying it does not come from experience. That is to say, experience by itself won't teach you Estel. Um, if you just look at the way the world Works. If you look around at what happens in the world, um, if if you're just looking around, sort of at eye level, what do you see? Suffering. I mean, you look at the history of Middle Earth, and it's a pretty rough go. You know, I mean, um, so no, he says experience won't teach it to you. Um, it comes from our nature and our first being. Um, Sam sees it when looking up, right? Um, it's not his own experience that teaches him Estelle. He doesn't... Because if so, it wouldn't be Estelle. It would be Amdir. It would be optimism. It would be the belief that things are going to get better or turn out nicely. As Finrod suggests, experience doesn't teach you that, right? So, so Erica, Finrod is well aware of the fact um, that God does indeed let bad things happen. But what Finrod does say is that God is good and God is in charge. Anyway, we're getting into, get, we're getting into theology, which of course is always a risk in bringing in the Athrobeth, because it's deeply theological. Um, yeah, you're right, Carissa, this is much bigger than a can. This is a full bag of worms. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway. Amdir, Estelle. 
That's the chief point, this distinction, that difference between the belief that things are going to be good or turn out well, and the that deeper hope, that that trust, which if not explicitly theological, uh, is at least on a broad worldview level and not um, just about the events of your life or uh, um, or you know anybody else's experience. Let us carry on to apply this now, or rather to see how this is raised, um, as I think it's raised very clearly in the story of Aragorn and Arwen. Here's how we begin. Eredor was the grandfather of the king. His son Erethorn sought in marriage Gilrain the Fair, daughter of Deerhile, who was himself a descendant of Aranarth. To this marriage Deerhile was opposed, for Gilrain was young and had not reached the age at which the women of the Dunedain were accustomed to marry. Moreover, he said, Arathorn is a stern man of full age, and will be chieftain sooner than men looked for, yet my heart forebodes that he will be short-lived. But Avorwin, his wife, who was also foresighted, answered, The more need of haste. The days are darkening before the storm, and great things are to come. If these two wed now, hope may be born for our people, but if they delay, it will not come while this age lasts. Okay. If these two wed now, hope may be born for our people. Um, what do they mean? What does she mean by that? Um, Deerhile is looking at this in a totally, well, not totally, in a pretty totally pragmatic way, right? Um, he's opposed to this because this seems like an unequal match. Uh, you've got, you know, Arthur is much younger. Gilrine's or Erethorn is much older, Gilrine is really young. Um, Ivorwin, of course, is saying, but now it has no idea, this is the anticipation, right, of his being named Estelle. Hope may be born for our people. Yes, if they are married, Estelle will in fact be born. But that's not his given name. Um, I think there's actually a question of cause and effect here. Uh, here's my question. Which word is she using here? Is she saying, if these two wed now, Amdir may be born for our people? Or is she seeing, saying, Estel may be born for our people? Which do you think it is? Any, any, any takers? Yeah, Tom Gilrain does later use Estelle, and of course Estelle is going to be the name he's going to be called, but it's not them that give it to him. He's called that in Rivendell. Elrond, presumably, though we're not told explicitly, is the one who names him Estelle, right? At least in Rivendell, maybe it's Gilrain. But, um, Rachel, I agree with you. I read it more as I'm dear. That is, the way that she talks about it. Hope may be born for our people. That is, things might get better for our people. Um, I foresee, she, she's, she's foreseeing here, right? She, a foretelling has come upon her, as happens to the Dunedain occasionally, apparently. Aragorn makes several successful prophecies uh, over the course of the Lord of the Rings, right? Prophesying that Gandalf, something bad is going to happen to Gandalf if he goes into Moria, prophesying that he and Eomir may meet again, though all the uh, the the the, uh, the armies of Mordor lie between them. Um, and so, you know, his uh, what, grandmother and grandfather are having the same experience here, right? Deerhile has a foretelling that Arathorn's going to die comparatively young. Which he will. If Orwin says, then we'd better hurry, because these two need to get married. If they are married, then hope may be born for our people. Um, that is the good thing, the improvement to the lot, the consummation of um, the consummation of their return. Right. This is this is the restoration of the line. Things are going to get better for the Dunedain. In fact, the Dunedain are going to be delivered. <clears throat> And as we see, of course, as will in fact come to fact uh, to to uh, come to um, come to effect, the whole the kingdom of Arnor is going to be restored, thanks to the one who is born, 
from Gilrein and Arathorn. So, um, is it um, is it looking up? It sounds to me like th things will look up for our people if 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 they get together. Estelle fit, fits. I think it works. But it doesn't sound like that's what she's thinking of. That he will restore the trust, the faith in some sense, of our people? That doesn't sound like what she means. Um, yes, Joshua reminds me of who are too. This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death, though we part here forever and I shall not look on your white walls again, from you and from me a new star shall arise. Star of high hope, right? Um, yes, Rebecca Aragorn does fulfill both Estelle and Umdir. That's right. Um, but uh, um, he will. But again, I, I, I don't think that that's what she has in mind here. So he's associated with hope at the beginning, though again, the initial association with hope seems to be one of that sort of optimism. If he's born, he might be the one to make good things happen, to bring the Dunedain out of their the sort of exile in which they're currently living. And in fact, he's going to do that. Now let's look at him. Then Aragorn took leave lovingly of Elrond. I love that. But especially, you, you sort of feel like Tolkien is emphasizing that, because we don't want to don't give you the wrong impression. We've seen, we have precedents <clears throat> thinking of Thingol, uh, for grud I, I, as we're instructed to think of Thingol, right? Uh, Aragorn himself is thinking of Thingol, um, and referring to him. But uh, but anyway, we've seen lots of uh, grudging father-in-laws with a very bad grace. But uh, uh, it's not the case, right? This is not a Baron and Thingol situation. Aragorn does leave, but he takes leave lovingly, not in bitterness, as Baron does. Anyway, then Aragorn took leave lovingly of Elrond, and the next day he said farewell to his mother, and to the house of Elrond, and to Arwen, and he went out into the wild. For nearly thirty years he labored in the cause against Sauron, and he became a friend of Gandalf the Wise, from whom he gained much wisdom. With him he made many perilous journeys, but as the years wore he went more often alone. As years wore on he went more often alone. His ways were hard and long, and he became somewhat grim to look upon, unless he chanced to smile, and yet he seemed to men worthy of honor, as a king that is in exile, when he did not hide his true shape. For he went in many guises, and won renown under many names. He rode in the host of the Rohirrim, and fought for the lord of Gondor by land and by sea, and then in the hour of victory he passed out of the knowledge of men of the west, and went alone far into the east and deep into the south, exploring the hearts of men, both evil and good, and uncovering the plots and devices of the servants of Sauron. So that by itself, that there's a pretty good resume, right? All the things that he, you know, referring to the things that he's done and to the ways that he has been, uh, to his character, somewhat grim unless he chanced to smile. I really like that. Um, uh, we see his his valor and his humility, right? These are all good things. And thus he became at last the most hardy of living men, skilled in their crafts and lore, and yet was more than they, for he was elven wise, and there was a light in his eyes, that when they were kindled few could endure. His face was sad and stern, because of the doom that was laid on him, and yet hope dwelt ever in the depths of his heart, from which mirth would arise at times like a spring from the rock." Estelle. Clearly Estelle here, right? Um, if he was going, if hope was going to be born for the people, that seems like Emdir. Things are going to get better for the Numenorians, uh, for the Dunedain. Uh, this is clearly not Amdir that is dwelling ever in the depths of his heart. This is clearly Estelle, from which mirth would arise at times like a spring from the rock, in despite of his experience, right? He becomes grim and hardy uh, and skilled. His ex What he experiences makes him to be okay, grim, sober. Grim, like, I always think of bard when I hear that, uh, when, you know, someone is being called grim. But yes, Rachel, I agree. This is 
This is clearly Estelle, that dwells in the depths of his heart, and which seems to be, in spite of his experience, um, exploring the hearts of men, both evil and good, uncovering the plots and devices of the servants of Sauron. Um, what he's seen in his life don't have any reason to think that this uh, leads him to a rosy and optimistic view of things, that everything's going to turn out nicely and things are generally pretty good and getting better. That's not, does not seem to be Aragorn's point of view. And yet, despite all of these things, hope dwells ever in his heart. And I think that this is not a consequence of all the stuff that came before, but I think that we can see it informing all of the things that came before. So Estelle, as he was called, seems to show and to hold Estelle. Then we get his conversation with Arwen, when they are betrothed. Then for a season they wandered together in the glades of Lothlorien until it was time for him to depart. And on the evening of midsummer, Aragorn, Aragorn's son, and Arwen, daughter of Elrond, went to the fair hill, Karen Emroth, in the midst of the land, and they walked unshod on the undying grass with Eleanor and Nifredil about their feet. And there, upon that hill, they looked east to the shadow and west to the twilight, and they plighted their troth and were glad. And Arwen said, Dark is the shadow, and yet my heart rejoices, for you, Estelle, shall be among the great, whose valor will destroy it. Es Amdir, right? She is expressing Amdir right there. She has hope. Hope that the dar dark is the shadow, but you shall be among the great, whose valor will destroy it. Arwen has Amdir. Right? She has hope that things are going to turn out well. Oh, uh, by the way, yes, Alyssa, I do totally agree with you. Um, uh, Alyssa says, Aragorn was called Estelle presumably before this trait became evident, but before he evidenced uh, uh, his own possession of Estelle. Is it possible Elrond meant Estelle when Evorwin did not? Uh, why was he not called Amdir in Rivendell? And I think the answer to that is because he was named by Elrond. Um, uh, who, I, you know, I, 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 I absolutely agree, Alyssa. I don't think that Evorwin was thinking of Estelle. But um, his being named Estelle instead of Amdir, not that they were like debating, should we name him Amdir or, or Amdir or Estelle? Uh, but rather, um, the sort of the irony of those two things um, that his grandmother says, prophesies, hope will be born for our people, and um, Elrond saying, let's name him Hope. Um, that, that works really well. But it becomes more complicated when you know about the two different words for hope and the two the two different kinds of hope. If you just think esto equals hope, it just sounds like um, like a really satisfying piece of irony, right? The prophecy and then the fulfillment um, by the fact that he's named that. That's really cool all by itself. But it gets more complicated when you think about the two different kinds of hope um, and the way that both of them are being expressed at different points in this um, in this little story here. Um, because yeah, I absolutely think. He is, he is, they, they are clinging to him as a, as hope, as Amdir, for their people. And Elrond says, no, yes, hope, yes, but Estelle, he is Estelle. Um, and Aragorn himself shows, Elrond is, right, he himself, Est he himself shows Estelle, um, holds to Estelle, rather than Amdir. Here's Arwen expressing Amdir. I think the shadow will pass and that you will be instrumental. I'm looking up towards that. And Aragorn's response, Alas, I cannot foresee it, and how it may come to pass is hidden from me. Yet with your hope, I will hope. I have no Amdir, he says. <laughs> he doesn't have Amdir, right? With your hope, I... If you have Amdir, I don't, right? I can't foresee it. I, I see no way... Based on my experience, I can see no reason to think that we're going to overthrow the shadow. How it may come to pass is hidden from me. From where I'm standing right now, it looks like we've got about a 0% chance of overthrowing the shadow. Aragorn doesn't have Amdir. And the shadow, I, I utterly reject. Estelle. That is, that's a worldview statement right there, right? Um, I don't have Amdir. I don't have optimism that, that we're going to win. But I know what side I'm on. I know what in what I am going to put my trust. 
and it is not the shadow. I utterly reject the shadow. Right. But neither, lady, is the twilight for me, for I am mortal, and if you will cleave to me, even star, then the twilight you must also renounce. And she stood then as still as a white tree, looking into the west, and at last she said, I will cleave to you, Dunadan, and turn from the twilight. Yet there lies the land of my people, and the long home of all my kin. She loved her father dearly. The loss of Arwen and Elrond, both. Um, the situation of Elrond in particular is so poignant in this story, I think. Um, <clears throat> the way in which it is clearly painted is made much more explicit in the appendix here than in the story about how either side, you know, once the ring is found, his doom is sealed. He knows one way or the other it's over. Um, the time of parting beyond the world has come. And one way or another, whether we win or whether we lose, I'm going to lose what I most love. Um, is a really, is a really poignant. Um, but now we go on to the passage. Several of you have been referring to, and I've not been, as, as many of you have been quoting for me, uh, Gilrein's uh, Linod. Um, but I was saying, we, we weren't there yet. We're going to do it now. After a few years, Gilrine took leave of Elrond and returned to her own people in Eriador and lived alone. And she seldom saw her son again, for he spent many years in far countries. But on a time, when Aragorn had returned to the north, he came to her, and she said to him before he went, This is our last parting, Estel, my son. I am aged by care, even as one of lesser men. And now that it draws near, I cannot face the darkness of our time that gathers upon Middle-earth. I shall leave it soon. Aragorn tried to comfort her, saying, Yet there may be a light beyond the darkness, and if so, I would have you see it and be glad. Yet there may be a light beyond the darkness. Wait, Amdir, hold on to Amdir. Don't give up Amdir. Don't give up hope. Right? But she answered only with this linod, Onan i estel idain, ucheben estel anim. I gave hope to the Dunedain, I have left none. I have left no hope, no Estelle, for myself. And Aragorn went away heavy of heart. Gilrine died before the next spring. Rebecca asks, does this mean Gilrine has forsaken Estelle? Or does she just think, or does she just think she has, and she's lost, she's actually lost her Amdir? Um, Tom says, doesn't the capitalization of the first Estelle suggest she gave him that name? It's quite possible. Um, Tom, I think there's only two candidates for that, the giving of the name. One would be Gilrine and one would be, uh, one would be um, Elrond. I could see either one of them. We don't know, but I could see either one of that working. That is, they bring him to, to Rivendell and Elrond says, we shall call him Estelle, right? Or him saying, he should not we should call him something else. Um, his real name and lineage should be concealed even from him. Uh, what should we call him? And Gilrine saying, how about Estelle? How about Hope? I could see either one of those things. I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Tom, does her use of that... Uh, it doesn't prove it. Uh, I mean, she calls him, she addresses him as Estelle, Estelle my son, uh, earlier on in this passage. So she, she talks to him and of him that way that she would use the name in that context could be... It doesn't necessarily mean that it comes from her, but... Um, anyway. She's... She despairs. But there's despair, and then there's despair, right? There's... Denethor's despair. Hope on then, right? Your hope is but ignorance. Um... His problem is not just that he loses Amdir, right? Sam loses Amdir too, but that leads him not to give up, but that leads him that to that hardening that we were talking about. That's what happens. You know, now that's... There are different ways to respond to loss of Amdir, right? But the difference, I think, is is primarily one of Esto. Why does Denethor... Both Denethor and Sam lose their Amdir completely? 
One goes one direction and one goes in the other direction. What's the difference? I would say Estelle is the difference. Sam doesn't lose his Estelle. Denethor does or never had it. And therefore, they come to, they apply themselves in very, very different ways when they both lose all of their Amdir. What's going on with Gilrine here? She says explicitly, um, I have kept no Estelle, no hope, for myself. I gave hope to the Dunedai, and I've kept none for myself. Um, yeah, Carolyn says, Gilrein reminds me of Feanor's mother uh, growing weary in spirit. Yeah, me too. Um, I've always been reminded of that as well. Yeah, but Diego said exactly the same thing at the same time, just like Muriel, yes. Um, yes. Um... She does seem to despair. And it's not just a lack of Amdir. Again, Aragorn doesn't have the Amdir. His own words are kind of empty. You know, when he says, there may, yet there may be a light beyond the darkness. Yeah, there might be a light beyond the darkness. But he told Arwen, I, I don't see how, right? He's not really holding out uh, the Amdir here. Um, she... She doesn't have the strength to go on, she says. She's kept no hope for herself. It's his Estelle that drives him. It's it's in that, you know, that final, you know, in the passage that I would give you before about Aragorn's career. Um, I think it's really significantly placed there after talking about what he did and how he was to end that description by saying yet hope ever dwelt uh, in his heart. Um, yeah. Yeah, Diego, you're right. She is simply... Her, uh, Diego says her line is just a play on words. Um, the capitalized first Estelle refers to him and the second one is her own uh, trust or faith. Um, yeah, yeah, her own her own hope. Um, Dylan says, does she also have the long li long life like that of the Dunedain? Yes, she does, or could. Um, she dies comparatively young for one of the Dunedain, as she herself admits. <laughs> Rebecca says, maybe the Estelle that would have nourished many went into him like Feanor. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's how hope works. I, I don't think you you kind of pass that along, you know, that to pour hope into your child, if that can be done in utero, uh, it empties it out of you, necessarily. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I like that, though. Um Let's come back to this when we look at Aragorn's own death scene, because that's, of course, where we're going to next. And then I'll finally let you go after keeping you extra long tonight. Um, this is long, but I, I, I couldn't see shortening this. Let's look. Let's uh, you know, th think, thinking through all this hope stuff. Um, let's look at the death of Aragorn here. Then going to the house of the kings in the silent street, Aragorn laid him down on the long bed that had, that had been prepared for him. There he said farewell to Eldarion, and gave into his hands the winged crown of Gondor and the scepter of Arnor, and then all left him save Arwen, and she stood alone by his bed. And for all her wisdom and lineage, she could not forbear to plead with him to stay yet for a while. She was not yet weary of her days, and thus she tasted the bitterness of the mortality that she had taken upon her. Lady Undomiel, said Aragorn, the hour is indeed hard, yet it was made even in that day when we met under the white birches in the garden of Elrond, where none now walk, and on the hill of Karen Amroth, where we forsook both the shadow and the twilight, this doom we accepted. Take counsel with yourself, beloved, and ask whether you would indeed have me wait until I wither and fall from my high seat, unmanned and witless. 
Nay, lady, I am the last of the Numenorians, and the latest king of the Elder Days, and to me has been given not only a span thrice that of men of Middle-earth, but also the grace to go at my will, and give back the gift. Now, therefore, I will sleep. I speak no comfort to you, for there is no comfort for such pain within the circles of the world. Experience, remember? The, utter, the uttermost choice is before you, to repent and go to the heavens, and bear away into the west, the havens, not the heavens, sorry, go to the havens, <laughs> oh, Freudian slip there, to repent and go to the havens, and bear away into the west the memory of our days together, that shall there be evergreen, but never more than memory, or else to abide the doom of men. Nay, dear lord, she said, that choice is long over. There is now no ship that would bear me hence, and I must indeed abide the doom of men, whether I will or I nil, the loss and the silence. But I say to you, King of the Numenorians, not till now have I understood the tale of your people and their fall. As wicked fools I scorn them, but I pity them at last. For if this is indeed, as the Eldar say, the gift of the one to men, it is bitter to receive. So it seems, he said. But let us not be overthrown at the final test, who of old renounced the shadow and the ring. In sorrow we must go, but not in despair. Behold, we are not bound for ever to the circles of the world, and beyond them is more than memory. Farewell. Estelle, Estelle, she cried, and with that, even as he took her hand and kissed it, he fell into sleep. Okay. <laughs> oh, so you're right. Gil Estelle is in the heavens. So there we go. Um, okay. I'm making Rebecca cry again. Yeah, that passage often gets not as not as continually. I'm such a sucker for you catastrophe. Uh, that off in our field gets me absolutely every time. But. Uh, uh, yeah. So what do we see here? Um, <laughs> she, the, the beauty, you know, the way in which the word hope, uh, is played on, um, in this story, uh, is very well done from the very first, you know, the op that opening passage where, with the prophecy of hope being born for the people, down through her cry at his deathbed, Estelle, Estelle, where beautifully she is calling to him by his childhood name, right, by the name uh, that he had when she met him when he was a 20-year-old kid in Rivendell. And, um, but also, she's literally crying, hope, hope, as he's lying, dying there. And Estelle is exactly what she is struggling with. Um, she alludes to the Numenorians, right? The Numenorians lost their way. What they lost was clearly not Amdir, right? They did think, apart from the whole death thing, things were going quite well for the Numenorians. They had lots of reasons. To, if anybody, if any society ever had reasons to look up, it was the Numenorians, right? That's one of the great ironies of the Numenorian story. In fact, that seems to be one of the one of the dominant themes of the Numenorian story. In fact, we see this as a theme throughout so many stories in Tolkien. Those who have the most reason to look up, those who have the most blessedness um, and the greatest uh, the most blessedness and the greatest power and the greatest resources are the ones so often that fall. Um, in other words, there is no clear correlation at all between Amdir and Estelle. Um, remember, it was Arwen who had the Amdir and Aragorn didn't, but he had, uh, he still had his Estelle, as he expresses it, even in that conversation with Arwen, um, while he is questioning uh, gently questioning the Amdir that she is expressing, the hope that she is expressing for their victory. Um, the Numenorians lose their Estelle. They question fundamentally. It becomes a worldview question. 
this whole death thing. What they become unwilling, what they what they come to do, is to rebel. Not, of course, just against the elves. Their war is not just one of of great, trying to seize immortality. They are trying to do that, but they are fundamentally and explicitly rebelling against Iluvatar himself. Um, they have lost their trust. They have lost their uh, their Estelle very clearly. Arwen says she now can understand them, right? And I think um, uh, Sharon Powell was making a really good point. And she says, you know, we can't think about this in a binary sense, you know, like a, um, zero hope and, and you know, having hope or not having hope. She says there are degrees of hope. Um, that, you know, you can lose some, but not all. Uh, of your hope, or you can so, and I think that certainly we don't want to uh, to 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 oversimplify this. Thinking, uh, Sharon, I think you were thinking of Gilrine, um, that she, her Estelle does seem to be flagging there, but I don't think that we, you know, she's not Denethor um, here. Uh, you can tell because she doesn't even try to set fire to her child. So obviously, it's not the same, um, but. Um, Anyway, but anyway, Sharon, I, I, I shouldn't make jokes. I, I, I do agree with you, and I think you make a very important point there. Um, and here we can see that in Arwen, too, right? She's struggling right now um, to hold to her Estelle. And that's true in several levels. She's trying to hold on to Estelle, both in not wanting to let Aragorn go, but also in struggling with her own... Um, her own worldview issues, you know, with, with, you know, she has, you know, as, as Carolyn says, she has to say goodbye to a lot. Um, you know, she has said goodbye to her father, her people, um, uh, you know, her culture, never ending life, all of these things she said goodbye to for him, right? She chose him rather than, and now she's losing him. Um, Arwen's loss is, you know, Arwen is not only a widow, she's like the widow, <laughs> right? She is, uh, she becomes in this moment, um, you know, the, the nearly the embodiment of bereavement, of loss, of the mortal status. Remember, again, remember Andreth, um, in, you know, the passage that I started with, um, you know, who, uh, sorry, I'm just going back to it in my notes, when she says, uh, you know, uh, Finrod says, have you then no hope? And she says, oh, you mean an an expectation of good, which, though uncertain, has some foundation in what is known? No, no, we don't have that, (laughs) right? Um, No, we have no hope. Well, you know, Arwen, um, our experience, says Andreth, does not teach us to hope, to think that things are going to turn out well. The grief, the loss, the bereavement, she tastes that now, and she can see how this grief, this loss, would shake your Estelle. Um, she looks back on her, you know, as wicked fools, I scorn them, she says, right? That is, from my secure position before, I thought the Numenorians were really stupid. I mean, I, 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 I just thought they were wicked fools. Now I can see. I can see what tempted them. I can see why they did what they did. Um, Aragorn's expression of Estelle is as clear here as it has been anywhere in his life. He remains, unsurprisingly, as, you know, that was his name, the embodiment here of Estelle. Um, Behold, we are not bound forever to the circles of the world, and beyond them is more than memory. Faith, trust, Estelle, right? He has hope. That is for him a supreme hope. In sorrow we must go, but not in despair. There is hope. We are not bound forever to the circles of the world, and beyond them is more than memory. Um, and of course, he's alluding to what he had just said before about, you know, uh, to go to the havens and bear away into the west the memory of our days together, that shall there be ever green, but never more than memory, or else to abide the doom of men. So the 
that's the choice, right? The choice is between life that is evergreen, but only memory. Um, that is, you know, where, where he w- she will have nothing but memories of them, or beyond the circles of the world, there is more than memory. But he doesn't know that. That was the problem for the Numenorians, right? They're saying, yeah, but 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 Avask is asked a blind trust and a hope without assurance. Those are the words of the Numenorians in the debate with the uh, with the Eldar, who sort of come as the representatives of the Valar to Numenor. When the Numenorians start going astray, to ask us is asked a blind trust and a hope without assurance. Yep, exactly. That is, in fact, what's asked of them. Trust. Hope. Um, and Aragorn expresses that here. He is letting go of his life. Now we see, we see think back and compare with Gilrain. Now, both Gilrain and Aragorn submit to death. Um, I do think Gilrain is a middle position. You know, if... And we talked at the time, of course, when we were discussing Denethor, of Aragorn as the obvious point of contrast for Denethor, in several senses. We see him explicitly claim the right. You know, authority is not given to you, Stuart of Gondor, to rule your own end. But it turns out, authority is given to Aragorn to rule his own end, uh, as he says. Um, to me has been given not only a span, thrice that of men of Minnow Earth, that is to say, I have lived three times as long as everybody else. And the subtext of there seems so it would be boorish of me to complain that eventually I have to die, um, but also the grace to go at my will and give back the gift. Um, not everybody has that grace. He does have the authorities. Okay, so we see this. we see this difference between the two of them, but again, the difference is not just Denethor is being presumptuous and Aragorn is not because he actually has that authority. The important thing um, the important thing is that um, is the whole attitude, the whole premise upon which he's going. He dies in hope. He dies in Estelle more explicitly than anybody else we see dying in you know the entire Tolkien tradition. Um, but um, but Denethor is obviously dying not only without hope, but because he has um, a bit, has given into despair to the, that despair, which is the opposite of Estelle, um, not the opposite of the opposite of Amdir. Gilrain, I think, is in the middle. Um, she clearly has despaired. I mean, she says that you know, I've kept no hope for myself. Having no hope is despair, right? Um, she's confessing to despair. She knows that she has despaired, but um, but she's not Denethor. You know, she's clear. You know, and her giving into death. Er, you know, you can see there's there's more dramatic irony there, right? Earlier with his mom, it was Aragorn who was saying, "No, no, no, don't die. Cling to life a little bit longer." And she's like, "No, no, I'm ready." It's time to go. Um, the circumstances are different for Gilrain and for uh, for Aragorn. She's going early, um, but I do think her death is not unpeaceful. <laughs> he says cautiously. Again, I don't think it's quite fair to say that her death is peaceful, because it is in it, there is despair. Um, but, um, but I don't think it's utterly unlike Aragorn's death either. Um, Erica says, "Estel equals faith." Yes, yes, I think it does equal faith. You know, trust is the word that Finrod uses. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's. Um, uh, I do think that that's um, a near synonym. I mean, I would use the word faith. I did use the word faith when I was talking about this stuff, um, especially in the Two Towers uh, course. Um, Yes, Dylan, Aragorn is an example of 
what the Numenorians were supposed to do, what they did before, what, how it was supposed to work. Um, Rachel makes an interesting point about Gilrine, saying she knows that hope exists even if she can't see it herself. Um, or I guess even I would say she doesn't apply it to herself. Um, she, she doesn't deny hope. Again, Denethor denies it, right? Your hope is but ignorance, he says. Um, he scorns and mocks at hope. Gilrine's not scorning and mocking at hope, right? She just doesn't apply it to herself. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Carissa is quoting another very wise book, Anne of Green Gables. Um, uh, Anne of Green Gables. You know, Carissa, the Anne of Green Gables books are almost to my wife what Tolkien is to me. Uh, Between Ella Montgomery and Jane Austen. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Carissa, I totally get that. Um, actually, had our honeymoon on Prince Edward Island, largely for this reason. But anyway, um, Carissa quoting Marilla in Anne of Green Gables, who says, to despair is to turn your back on God. Yes, that is the traditional Christian idea. That's why despair was the greatest of sins. I mean, literally one of the... I mean, pride is the great sin, which underlies all other sins. But despair is a huge, huge deal. Um, you know, despair, one hope, to use the, the old Middle English word, um, is one of the most one of the one of the one of the 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 most dangerous paths the most horrible ends that you can come to carissa for exactly that reason but um i and and carissa i do think you know i the 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 very wise um the very wise marilla of anne of green gables um I, I, I think is right to define that. You think uh, back to uh, uh, Diego, I think you were, who was it, who was just quoting Gandalf's definition of despair um, back in the Council of Elrond. No, Yana, it was you. Um, despair is for those who see the end beyond all doubt. Yes, that's the despair which is the opposite of Amdir, right? Um, who see the end beyond all doubt. That's what Sam, that's what happens to Sam when he throws away his pans, right? He sees the end beyond all doubt. So he despairs in that sense. But he does not, uh, uh, um, uh, Carissa, turn his back on God, right? He doesn't, uh, and again, I, I, I shouldn't apply Anne of Green Gables vocabulary to Tolkien's vocabulary because, as I said, that's not Sam's vocabulary. Um, but, but, Nevertheless, Carissa, I don't regret it because I do think that that really kind of gets to the point. It, it's that kind of a worldview thing. Um, again, that's that's the difference between what Denethor does and what um, and what uh, um, and what uh, th that's the difference that we see between Aragorn and Denethor. That's the difference that we see between Sam and Denethor. That turning that turning away from Amdir, but not turning away from Estel. Carissa, the point you were uh, trying to make there um, was she doesn't think that, that that kind of despair, the bigger despair, is what Arwen does. She's sad and doesn't want life on Earth without Aragorn, um, but that's not turning uh, your back on Estelle. Um, no, no, I don't think that she is, ultimately. But remember, in their first conversation, the not the first conversation, in their betrothal conversation, they both spoke of hope. She has Amdir, right? I think things are going to turn out well. And I think that you're going to be instrumental. I think this is going to be great. And he's like, mm, mm, maybe. Uh, I don't see it, but okay. Um, she seems, you know, I'll hope with your hope. I'll, I'll hope with your Amdir, right? Um, I'll let you have Amdir for the both of us. He had the Estelle. She had the Amdir. Now, things are not looking up for Arwen anymore, right? For her, Amdir is permanently over. Now she's lost everything. Well, if you don't count her children, but whatever. Um, anyway, she's she's lost everything else. Um, 
and uh, but I but I agree. I don't think that she has completely that she is com- we're, that we are to read this as her completely losing Estelle, and that's one of the things that I think uh, that we see um, in her final cry of Estelle, Estelle. Again, she's clinging to Estelle in more than one sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Diego says, can we say that Amdir is close to the exercise of Estelle, or sort of Estelle applied in a particular way? No, no, remember the distinction that Finrod is making about one being based on experience and the other not. Um, he's saying they're fundamentally different things in that way. That is, Estelle does not necessarily lead you to believe that. Erica, this comes back to the objection you made way back at the beginning when, uh, of this discussion. Um, Estelle does not lead you to say, I think things are going to turn out great. Because they might not. <laughs> in fact, there's a really good chance that they won't. As Aragorn knows, he's seen a lot of the world now, right? Um, even though he's not been alive as long as as... Arwen, she has actually been kind of sheltered and has not, it seemed, experienced quite as much of the world as he has. Um, certainly when they meet again for that second time, he seems to be more wise in this way than she is. But anyway, um, he... So again, Estelle doesn't lead to Amdir. Um the more you experience of the world, the less Amdir you're likely to have as Aragorn, as in fact happens to Aragorn. But that doesn't have anything to do with your Estelle, and your Estelle doesn't have anything to do with that. Having Estelle doesn't make him cheerful. It makes him grim. Or rather, he is grim, despite the fact that he has Estelle, or at the same time as he has Estelle. Um, So I think that in that way, those two things are really quite different. Um... Joshua says, as Estelle, the belief in you catastrophe. Closer. Closer. I would say that thinking back to the definition of you catastrophe that Tolkien gives that we were discussing last time, um, you catastrophe, he says, is a sort of a, a denial of the final defeat. In that sense, yes, not necessarily belief that you catastrophe is going to happen but belief in that principle which you catastrophe reveals or provides a glimpse of as Tolkien describes it um, remember he cautiously pulls out the word evangelium good news um, of that you catastrophe is pointing to it is in that sense good news because it shows it denies the final ultimate defeat um Evil is not going to win in the end. There is light and high beauty above the shadow that the shadow cannot reach. That belief is the belief is the consolation that you catastrophe brings. Um, so, holding to a worldview that believes in you catastrophe is Estelle. Thinking that you catastrophe is likely in your case, and it's going to show up any second, is Amdir. <laughs> and, and not necessarily a, a sort of a... You know, as, as Rebecca reminds... Uh, Rebecca and Tom um, uh, have reminded at the same time, Eucatastrophe is never to be counted on to recur, as Tolkien says in his definition. And you can't look upwards to it. You can't have Amdir for Eucatastrophe. Um... Yeah, yeah. Noam points out, if you have Amdir, you don't need Estelle. Right? If you just think things are going to turn out well, yeah, then you don't need... Estelle is what you cling to. The concept of Estelle, this, 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 this way of thinking and talking about hope, is not only, is, is not only very Christian, it's very medieval Christian. Um, it's very Pauline. This is the way that St. Paul talks about hope. Um, especially uh, in Romans, especially in Romans chapter 8. Um, but it's... Um, but the medievals were all about this kind of hope. This is, the, this is the theological virtue of hope. The medieval symbol of hope, which is again drawn from New Testament imagery, is an anchor. 
um, you can always tell the allegor going back to allegory, you can always tell when the allegorical figure of hope uh, appears on stage because she usually has an anchor or she's carrying an anchor over her shoulder. Um, uh, if uh, the figure of hope got a tattoo, she'd totally get like Popeye's anchor tattoo on her forearm. Um, the anchor is the symbol of hope. And again, it's that anchor that Arwen needs, you know, that she is clinging to, Estelle, Estelle, um, in her moment of grief and of despair in this sense. Um, but uh, um, again, that's what Estelle provides. Amdir doesn't provide that. Um, you need that anchor when your Amdir wavers or dies. Um, so yeah, in those ways, those are uh, um, different um, fu- fundam- fundamentally different things. Um, yeah, Ewan says the combination of grimness and and hope seems a bit unusual, since the normal assumption is that if one has hope, one should be happy. I like that combination, though it seems perhaps oddly uh, rather more realistic. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's much more. Um, it's a much more complicated, it's much more profound, I think, um, concept of hope. Because you're right. Um, to be hopeful means to be cheerful, right? But again, that's re- it's, when people are talking that way, it's just I'm dear, right? To say, I'm a hopeful person, usually means I generally think things are going to turn out well. Um, in which case, you're probably a fool if you think that. <laughs> At least that's what Tolkien suggests, I think. Um, uh, Andreth has no hope, has no Amdir, uh, not because she is, uh, not because she's a fool, but because she's wise. Um, Aragorn is grim, Bard is grim, not because <laughs> they're fools, but because they're wise. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, good. Okay, well, I should, um, um, I should let you go. I've kept you, I think, to a record lateness here, uh, and we still barely talked about Appendix A. Of course, all this stuff was from Appendix A. I hope you see why I wanted to start with this, to kind of jump ahead, rather, uh, to the story of Aragorn and Arwen, because it, it, I, just as I was reading it again, and I was rereading it twice earlier today, and, um, the way that the hope terms jump out here, um, it's just, it's to me, sort of a perfect capstone to the discussion of hope that we were having before, so I wanted to go ahead and make sure to have that. Um, next time we'll talk more. We'll probably do an extra session, I think. Um, but uh, anyway, as I say, um, so if we don't get to everything next time, uh, don't despair, because we may uh, we may still have some other uh, some other chances. But um, uh, but as I said before, please do email me if there, cause there's so much material and it's so varied. Um, I have no very clear class plan for the next class session. Um, and what I want to talk about things, observations that you make, um, questions, and they don't have to be questions. If you do have questions, that's great. But again, if you have observations, stuff, stuff that you notice, um, Ed has already sent me uh, a very interesting pronunciation observation. Um, Ed is wanting to point out um, a way in which everybody mispronu- mispronounces um, uh, 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 a, one of the most common names uh, in The Lord of the Rings. Um, Diego asks, at what email address can you write to me? Um, you can write to me at olson at mythguard.org or olson at tolkienprofessor.com. Either one of those will get to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, anyway. So we were, and, and remember, next week's class session is in the earlier time frame, so it's going to be 4 p.m. Eastern time um, next week, and then we'll, uh, um, and then we'll see about an extra session. Um, um, uh, R- Rebecca asks which email is best. Probably the MythGuard one, but again, either one of them will get to me. But the MythGuard one's a little bit easier. So thanks, everybody. 
Thanks for joining me, and have a good night. And I look forward to a a wide and varied um, appendix discussion next time. Uh, so thanks very much, everybody. Good night.